subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, you're welcome to SHSR on Joy Learning. Today we've come again to you with a subject called mathematics. So this is going to be SHS 1 core mathematics. And the topic for the day is plane geometry 1. Plane geometry 1. We are going to do part 1. My name is Evans Oday. I'm your facilitator for today. So let's go to core mathematics for senior high school 1. And we are looking at plane geometry 1. And we are going to handle part 1 today. And our next meeting will be doing part 2, part 3. Because plane geometry seems to be very complex complex um, topic and we need to do more for it and as usual with your calculators and your books and your pen get them ready if you don't have them please go quickly and get your pen and your books and then get your calculator so that we'll be working together i don't want you to sit down and be watching like you're watching a movie this is a class you need to participate in everything that we do and as usual with our status and today our starter is going to be a motivational word, a motivational word, something to think about, something to prepare your mind as you learn and as you journey in your academic career. Education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. Education is not the learning of the facts, of facts, but training of the mind to think, said by Albert Einstein. And whatever we are giving you in school is not just to memorize something, write exams and pass, and you say that is all. No. Our aim is to prepare your mind so you can think and be creative, be innovative, be problem solver. That is all about education. And mathematics does a lot in that direction. Mathematics is all about preparing you to build your thinking um, capability, to build analytical skills. And to become more problem solver, more um, critical thinker, and an innovator. That's all we want you to do. So don't learn for examination. Learn for life. Learn to build your capacity so that you can be the best you ought to be in the country. So for today, like we said, we are doing plane geometry one, and we are dealing with part one. And for part one, today we are going to handle the following objectives. By the end of today's section, you should be able to identify and explain different types of angles, explain the meaning of complementary and supplementary angles, and solve related problems that goes with them. Then again, we are going to identify, or by the end of the lesson, we'll be able to identify and calculate angles on a straight line and angles around a point. And then, if time permits us, we'll further go on to describe vertically opposite angles. So these are objectives and we hope we'll be able to achieve all of them before we end today's lesson. So what is plane geometry? What is it about? What are we going to learn as far as this topic is concerned? Here we say it is a branch of geometry that deals with properties of plane figures. A branch means geometry itself is a very big um, program or let's say a course. And we are looking at only plain geometry. In future, we're looking at um, solid geometry. And then we also have what we call coordinate geometry. And in some cases, we also talk about analytical geometry. And so we are dealing with an aspect where um, we deal with objects that are flat, such as triangles, circles, lines, that can be drawn on a flat piece of paper. And so plane geometry is all about two dimensions, and no, we can't hold two dimensions. So we are going to talk about the, the square, the angles, the lines, and so on and so forth. So talk of plane, yes, we have other shapes that are considered as plane, like triangle is a plane figure, circle is a plane figure, um, pyrogram is a plane figure, we have a square plane figure, rhombus, and so on and so forth. Right. Now, in geometry, we have several undefined terms. Terms like point, line, and plane. In fact, they are very difficult to define. But then if you're able to define them, 
they will serve as the basis for other definitions. So from these three undefined terms, all other terms in geometry can be defined. All right, so we see that in all geometry, it's all about point, lines, plane, angles, and so on and so forth. Even with angles, it comes from the definition of a line or using line to define angles. So, based on this three, we can look at them. So, we want to look at them one after the other. Maybe you talk of plane, what is plane? And topic itself is plane geometry. So, when we say plane, what does it mean? All right, so by definition in geometry, we are saying for plane, it is a flat surface that extends forever in two dimensions, but has no thickness. The moment it gets thickness, then it means it will be a three dimension. And so it has only two dimensions, and it can be like this or like that. This is the same as this. So they move in the same direction, no opposite direction, but this also is the same as that. So this two dimension is what we are referring to. But then if you're able to do something like this, then we get three dimension. So we can have this following the same as that. And we can have this also going this way. And we can have this going that way. And we get three dimension. And so for what we are going to look at today is two dimensional figures. So can we identify planes in our immediate environment? Per the definition that we have here, if we say plane is um, a flat surface that extends forever in two dimension and has no thickness, how do we identify things around ourselves, our environment as planes? So you can look at a field here, you can look at this, um, a room carpet or something. I mean, plane is a flat surface, it's infinitely long and um, it, I mean, extends forever. And there's no thickness. So indirectly, what we are saying is that we can't hold plane. Plane figure, you can't hold plane figure. You can't hold it. And so sometimes you tell students you can't hold it, say, oh, but you can hold a paper like this one. Yes, paper, this paper has a, 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 a shape, and this is um, um, sector, right? But I can hold it because it has a thickness, okay? But if there's no thickness, then the surface we see here becomes a plane surface, and this plane shape is a sector, right? So that is what plane is all about. Then let's talk about point. Remember, we are talking about three undefined terms. I've mentioned the plane. The second one is point. Then the third one is going to be the line. What is a point? What is a point? What is a point? Normally, if you ask this question in class, students will say point is a dot. No, point is not a dot. Okay. Point is a location. Point is a precise location or a place on a plane. Usually, we represent it by a dot. It doesn't mean dot is a point. We, we use dot to represent a point on a plane. But ideally, plane is a location or a place on a plane. So if you look at this example here, you see a table, which is a plane. And I have a laptop here. I have a pen. I have a bottle of water. I have a mouse. I have a speaker. They are all on top of this table. So if the table is a plane, then the position of each of these objects is the location. That is the point of reference. And so on this table, the mouse is at a particular place. So that is the point. The laptop is on a place or is at a place. The water is at a place. So the location of the water, I can put a dot there to show that that is the point of where the water is located. Right. So that is that. When we come to mathematics, normally when we are talking about points, we normally represent point on a Cartesian plane. So if I have x and y axis here, and I locate um, a point which is, let's say, point A. Let me call it point A. And the point A is a place. It means if I start from the origin here, for me to locate that place, I must move two steps on the x axis and three steps on the y-axis, and I'll get to the place. And so if this place is an origin where you are standing right now, and you are asked to locate a town called Town A, and then the dimension given you is that move two steps on the x-axis and move three on the y-axis, you locate a place called a point. And so point A is a place on this Cartesian plane, 
right? Let's take note of this. It is important to understand that a point is not a thing, but a place. Like I said, we indicate position of a point by placing a dot with a pencil or any other thing. A point has no dimension. Take note of that. It has no dimension because it's not a thing, it's just a place. So I can locate point with dot. So you can see this plane here. I can locate a dot. I can also locate a point on a line. I can locate a point on a line. Let's assume that um, this point are places in a particular place. Okay. And if they are on the same straight line, then it creates what we call collinear point. And so we have another term we call collinear point, which means if a set of points lie in a straight line, they are called collinear point. So if I have countries and all the countries on the map can be located on the same straight line with dots, then we can see those countries are collinear countries. That means they are on the same straight line. So points that lies on the same straight line are called collinear point. And so if you look at this map, look at the country, the, um, Germany we have, in India here we have, um, maybe Indonesia, Australia, you can see that if you track these countries on the map and you draw a line through all the places that they are located, you see they will be on the straight line. And when they are on the straight line, we say they are in collinear. I mean, the points over there are collinear points. So the countries can be called collinear countries. That means they lie on the same straight line on our map. If you look at this particular field too, you can see the location of this, location of that. They all are on the same straight line. And so we can say they are collinear points. Collinear points. Then again, if a set of points lie on the same plane, they are called coplanar. And so let's have this, our cream surface here, or the rectangular surface here as a plane, and I locate point A here, point B, point C, point D, point E, you see that they are not necessarily on the straight line, but they are all on the plane. And so we say they are coplanar. I say they are coplanar. So you can see that on this sideboard here, you can see the um, spot of the blue. I mean, that makes a coplanar on the same plane. And if you look at this picture here too, we have um, tennis balls. They are all on the flat surface. And you can see here that um, those tennis balls can be considered as coplanar. I mean, they are located on, on, on the um, field. And so they are coplanar. The position of the balls are coplanar because they are not on a straight line. Then the last um, undefined term we want to talk about that will help us to define all other geometrical terms is line. What is a line? What is a line? That's a big question I want to ask. What is a line? In geometry, there are a lot of definitions for line, but then in geometry, uh, we can consider this definition as um, a line is a geometrical object, because we are talking about geometry, it's a geometrical object that is straight, infinitely long, and infinitely thin. That is a line. So ideally, we can draw a line because it has no beginning, it has no end. It's infinitely long. So if you want to draw a line, I mean, you can't finish drawing it. That is why in drawing a line, we use this arrow to show that it has no beginning, it has no end. So what you see here is a line because I've indicated with an arrow telling you that there's no beginning and there's no end. And so anytime you draw a line, and you want us to know that that is a line, you must indicate with arrows to show that a line. Other than that, that should be something different. That is why in drawing normal line, you always see that we draw normal line and we show these symbols. And then we indicate our maybe zero and then one, two, and three, and then we do go that way. Even in Cartesian plane too, we show with arrows to show that the x axis is a line. So it has no beginning, it has no end. Y axis too is a line, it has no beginning, it has no end. And so in geometry, we are saying that a line is straight. That means no curves. 
it has thickness. Sorry, it has no thickness. Sorry for that. It has no thickness. And it extends in both directions without end. So we say it is infinitely long. Right. So I can have a railway line where we see that the railway has no beginning, there's no end. It goes on and on. Even though there may be a beginning somewhere, but at any point that where you see it, you see that you can't track the beginning, you can't track the end. Unless probably you go to the railway station where you see where it starts, then you can think of that. But when you meet it in town, it's like there's no beginning, there's no end. Because you keep following it, you walk and walk and you get tired and you have to stop. Right. And if you see our roads to almost the same, sometimes you want to track a road, you continue, when con they realize you are in the sea. <laughs> right. Okay, so that can represent um, a line. Then we also talk about line segments. And this is what we draw almost every now and then. The moment you draw a straight line, then it means um, you've drawn a line segment. And we are saying by definition, line segment is part of a line that connects two points. It's part of a line that connects two points. It has definite end points. Uh, in some cases, you see people defining line as a line is anything that uh, exists between two points. When you define a line by saying it exists between two points, then you are, you are talking about line segment, but not line. Line has no beginning, it has no end. But line segment has a beginning and it has an end. So that is line segment for you. And you can see here that if I pick my ruler and um, I, I have a beginning of the ruler here, the end of it here, it can be a line segment. The pencil has a beginning, it has an end. We can create a line segment for that. Even on our fields, um, let's say you have a basketball field and other stuff, you also see line segment. So this one starts here, it ends here. And then on our rows, we see this marks that is used to indicate zebra crossing. They are all line segments. Um, they have a beginning and they have an end. Very interesting course, right? That is um, geometry for you. It's very wonderful because geometry is all around us. We see it every day. In fact, without geometry, um, the world would have been a bit weird. I mean, we wouldn't have seen the beauty of the world because geometry is giving us that sort of beauty, that, I mean, angles and the shapes and stuff. Now let's talk about ray. Ray. Another line we want to talk about is ray. A ray is a line that starts out at a point and continues off to infinity. So it has a beginning, but no end. In fact, this reminds me of a man in the Bible. The Bible says um, he has no beginning, he has no end. And I'm sure you know that person, Mekisede. So Mekisede can be like um, a line. He has no beginning, he has no end. That means there's no um, a point where we can make a reference that he was born on this particular day and he died on this particular day. He was not born, he didn't die. So it's like a line. Then we have... Those of us who were born and then one day would die, I mean, we will represent the line segment, right? Because you have a beginning, you have an end. And we have others too who had beginning, but they didn't have an end. I mean, they didn't die. They live forever. And example is um, Enoch. Enoch was born, but he didn't die according to the Bible. And um, um, Elijah was born, he didn't die. So Elijah would be a ray. Was maybe anybody who was born and died will be a line segment, and Mekisedek will be the um, the line who has no beginning and has no end. Now let's talk about angles. Now we've been able to talk about the undefined terms, the line, the point, and then the plane. Now based on these three, we can define all other geometrical figures. So example of geometrical figure is an angle. So let's talk about angles. What is an angle? What is it? What is an angle? Angles are formed, and I'm underlining the word are formed, because in some cases people will say angle is formed. Then when you draw two or more straight lines, you create angles. And so angles are formed when two or more straight lines meet at a point, and the point they meet is called vectors. Okay? So that's one definition. In fact, when you search for definition for angles, you have about thousands of them. But they all point to one formation, I mean one thing. That is what we have here. So if I have two lines meeting at a point, and the point is called vectors, 
then we create two angles here. So you see where the angle one is and then the other angle is. So let me call this angle one and angle two. In future, we're going to learn to know that angle one is reflex angle and angle two is an acute angle because it's less than 90. So angles are formed when two lines meet. So even if I draw this, two lines meet here, we have four angles created here. Can you see that? If I do this, I have four angles created. And so angles are formed when two lines meet at a point. Then we have this one called the arm of the angle or the side. Some case we call the side of the angle. Okay, so the arm or the side of the angle. Then others would define it as this. Angle is a shape formed by two straight lines or rays diverging from a common point. So you see they diverge from a common point. So two rays diverge from a common point. We create angles over there as well. Once again, we have our vectors as a meeting point, and then we have that. And so we have angles everywhere. This is a Dinkras symbol, okay? And this is a Dinkras symbol. We can see angle created here. It means we knew angle right from day one. Our forefathers who gave us these designs knew angle when they were giving us a Dinkras symbol. And it's so amazing that a Dinkras symbol speaks a lot to us each and every day as we meet them in our clothes, in our walls, in books, etc. Now, this symbol simply says, um, God won't die for me to die. A symbol expressing the immortality of human soul. It means that if we trust in God, as far as God remains, God will not die. Our soul will, will stay forever. So even if we die today, our soul will never die. will remain to eternity. That is why you have to give your life to Christ so that when you die, you know you can stay with God forever. If not, then whatever happens, the choice is yours. All right. So that is, we can see angles here as we look at this aging class symbol. In fact, a lot of them has a lot of angles. And if you look at this object here, you can see an angle everywhere. I mean, angle everywhere. You can see the bridge here. Angles are located every aspect. So we see that in our everyday life, we design buildings, we um, build other artifacts, and angles is everywhere. Even in our buildings, we see angles in our windows. I mean, even the food that we eat, hmm, some of the food, we have angles in them. Oh, yeah, that is true. On our roads, we see angles. Now they'll tell you, oh, when you get to the T-junction, the T-junction, you see an angle over the right. God, you, see, you get to Y junction and I've been hearing this every now and then. So we see angles in our everyday life. You see this plane here, an angle is created there. And so the designer of this plane knows about angle. That is why mass is very important. Mass is our everyday language. So you can't stay without mass. Now people ask questions, uh, why, why, why are we doing all this? In fact, without mathematics, you can't speak in this world and clarify things. Because if you're an engineer and you are going to express why you did this particular plane in this particular design, you should be able to use the term angle. Or the angle between the body and then the, the wings is that. I mean, that is um, angle for you. Now, how do we measure angles? How do we measure angles? Angles are measured using an instrument called a protractor. And you can see it on the screen here. That's a protractor. And I'm sure you know how to use it in measuring angles. Right from primary school, you were taught how to use protractor in measuring angles. They are measured in degrees. So when we are talking about angles, we are talking about degrees because angles are measured in degrees. In some cases, too, we measure angles using radians. We use radians and sometimes we use grades to measure angles. And when you are doing elective math, in some aspect of trigonometry, they will ask you to leave your answers in radians. So if you have, let's say, 180 degrees, you know that to be pi. Pi radian. So pi radian gives you 180. And then 90 degrees will give you half um, radian. So half pi radian. I mean, that's that. Types of angles. Very important concept we need to understand because as we speak and use the language of angles, angles comes in different sizes and um, different shapes. And we should be able to use correct language to express them. We have what we call acute angle acute angle or acute angles. By definition, here we say that acute angle 
is an angle less than 90 degrees. It's less than 90 degrees. So if you look at this diagram here, you see that all the angles right from zero, sorry, right from maybe after zero, one, two, three, up to 89 point, whatever, those sort of values between zero and 90, any angle there is called acute angle. So it lies between zero and 90, or we can say it's an angle less than 90 degrees. Now I'm saying nine, less than 90 degrees because if you come to the zero, zero doesn't create any angle, so we wouldn't even talk about it. And so we have um, any angle less than 90 degrees. So in real life situation, we see angles in acute form. Sometimes when your time is, um, let's say, um, 12, 10, the angle between the hour hand and that of the minute hand creates an acute angle. When you slice your um, pizza, sometimes, most of the times, you slice them with an angle of acute. Your scissors sometimes opens with an angle of acute because scissors doesn't go beyond... Um, so it goes beyond 90, but not up to more than 180. And mostly, we open it to acute angle to cut. So these are examples of acute angles. A lot of them, as you can see them in and around your environment. Then after acute angle, we have what we call right angle, right angle. Now, we said that when the angle is less than 90, it is acute. What if it's exactly 90? It's exactly 90, then it's called right angle. As I stand right now, my body and then the floor makes an angle of 90 because I am vertical and then the floor is horizontal. And so the vertical and horizontal always meet at angle of 90 degrees. So by definition, we say it's an angle formed by two perpendicular lines. We'll be talking about this in future or they meet at 90 degrees. Right angle is an angle of 90 degrees. An example can be this. You see this particular um, wooden structure here. You see vertical, then you see horizontal, and that is 90. And this is a symbol we use to represent 90 degrees. So anytime you draw a diagram, let's say a triangle, and you see this symbol here, it means we are dealing with 90 degrees, or those two lines are perpendicular to each other. Another example can see, you can see when it's three o'clock exactly with your hour and then your minute hand, you see 90 degrees there. Your table, normally when it is, um, the, the legs are vertical and the top is horizontal, we create angle of 90. On top of our windows, we have 90 degrees. When we stand, we make an angle of 90 with the floor or the ground that we are on. That is, I mean, um, these are all examples of right angles. Then let's talk about obtuse angle. So now we are traveling. Right from zero, we're talking about acute angle until we hit 90 degrees, then we change the name and we call it, um, we call it um, right angle. Now as we travel beyond 90, now we've entered into numbers that are bigger than 90, like 120, 152, um, 179. They are all more than 90 but we've not gotten to 180 yet. So angles that lies between 90 and 180 between are referred to as obtuse angles. So example of obtuse angle can be 120 degrees, 150 degrees, 93 degrees, 90.2 degrees is obtuse, right? So in structures, we see obtuse angle. Right now, our time is 8 um, o'clock. And when the time is 8 o'clock, between the hour hand and then the minute hand, we see an angle which is more than 90. It will be 90 when it comes like this, right? That is, let's say, if it is 9 o'clock, it will be 90. But then if it is 8 o'clock, it will be um, obtuse angle. Then on the roof here, you can see one eight, uh, sorry, obtuse angle there. Look at this fan here, we see obtuse angle. With this angle, we can also see obtuse angles. So angles are everywhere, everywhere. Then we have what we call straight angle. Now, right from zero, we enter into acute angles. Exactly 90, we call it right angle. 
after 90, before we get to 180, we call it obtuse angle. What if it falls exactly on the 180 line, then that becomes a straight angle. So straight angle is an angle of 180 degrees, all right? 180 degrees, beautiful. So again, we say angle that forms on a straight line is 180. It doesn't mean a straight line has an angle of 180. Be careful with that. People have been making this error. When I draw a straight line, for example, I draw a line segment, point A and point B. This is just a line segment from A to B. It starts from A, it ends at B. There's no angle here because I don't have two or more lines meeting. You understand? But the moment I create another point here, that means that also becomes another line segment. So I can have line segment AC and CB. They are meeting at this point. For that matter, the angle that exists becomes 180. So angles formed on a straight line makes an angle of 180. It doesn't mean all straight lines have 90, 180 degrees as an angle. It's not true. Let's be careful when we are trying to define straight angle. Then we go beyond 180. We go beyond 180, we call it reflex angle. Reflex angle. That means a reflex angle is an angle more than 180 degrees, but less than 360 degrees. So we've traveled beyond 180. So 270, 280, 300, 345, 359 degrees. They are all reflex angles. Example can be this. You can see reflex angle here with your compass. You can see it under the staircase here. You can see it over here too as well. I mean, we see reflex angle a lot in our environment. Let's talk about a very important concept as far as angles are concerned. We have what you call complementary angles and supplementary angles. We want to look at what entails into these two concepts here. What are complementary angles? When we say angles are complementary, what does it mean? What does it mean? When we pick two angles, 20, 70, 20, 30, 2, 5, 7, 10, any two angles at all you pick, and you bring them together, you sum them, and they give you 90 degrees exactly, then those two angles are called complementary angles. So if I pick 70, what will I add to 70 to give me 90? 20. In that case, 70 and 20 are complementary angles. As simple as that, right? Very simple. So 33 degrees, 57 degrees will add up to 90. So they are complementary. Beautiful. Now, if you look at this right angle triangle here, you see that for right angle triangle, when one angle becomes 90, the remaining two angles must obviously becomes complementary to each other. So we call them complementary angles. So angle A and B are complementary angles. So here we can see that the two pencils here, or the pencil yellow and have the brown, makes an angle of 90. Then we have this um, green pencil here. Then you can see the two, we create two different um, angles. And because these two angles will add up to give you 90, we can say angle alpha and angle beta are complementary angles, right? Then again, this is very important because I'm going to give you questions that you need to use the concept of what I'm going to, I'm going to talk about right now to answer. The complementary, the complementary of the angle theta is written as 90 minus theta. What it means is that if I give you an angle, let's say um, 30, and I ask you what is complementary to angle 30? What is complementary to angle 30? That means I'm asking you 90 minus 30, what is the answer? You understand? So 60. In that case, 60 and 30 are complementary. They add up to 90 degrees. Then we talk about supplementary angles, supplementary angles. And again, whilst we are saying complementary add up to 90, supplementary also add up to 180. Example can be 
60, One degree and 179 degrees will give you supplementary angles. 82, 98, they are supplementary. These are supplementary angles. So you can see they form, the two angles are lying on the straight line, having a common vectors. And so we add them up to give you 180. That means they are supplementary. Now you can see this diagram here, which is a pyrogram. We are saying angle A and B are supplementary because for every pyrogram, the consecutive angles always add up to 180. And so we can say angle A and angle B are supplementary. We'll talk about um, properties of quadrilaterals. In future, you will understand this aspect that I've just mentioned. In circle theorem, which I know when you, you do this topic in year two, when we have a circle and we draw um, um, a circle quadrilateral, uh, quadrilateral A, B, C, so a quadrilateral A, D, B, C, you see that each of the points touches the circumference of the circle. What we are saying is that opposite angles at opposite segments are always supplementary. Just want to give you examples of supplementary that we see in course of our work. Now, if an angle is theta, then its supplementary angle ought to be 180 minus theta. Very important concept to understand as well. Let's take a few questions under what we've done so far, especially with complementary angles. Few examples. I have a question here. Find the angle which is three times eight supplementary. Find the angle, which is three times eight supplementary. I don't know the angle, but what I know is that if that angle is, let's say theta, it's three times eight supplementary. So if theta is an angle, then eight supplementary angle will be what? We learned that that's going to give us 180 minus the theta. Okay, and if this theta is equal to three times its supplementary angle, then you are going to have everything multiplied by three here. What is the angle, or what angle are we talking about here, which has eight supplementary angle three times? And so theta now becomes three times 180 is going to give us um, 540, right? Let me be very sure. Sometimes I over, yeah, I think I'm right, 540. Then three times um, theta will give us three theta, right? Again, we want to find a theta as a subject. We can group like terms and we have our theta plus three, and the answer will be 540 here, which we have this equals 540. If we divide both sides by four, then we can get our theta to be 135 as the answer. Now, these questions comes a lot, and you realize that your understanding to the concept of supplementary and complementary angles helps you solve questions of this sort. Let's take another example and see. If x is a quarter of eight supplementary angle, find the value of x. If s is a quarter of eight supplementary angle, find the value of x. How do we handle this question? If s is a quarter of eight supplementary angle, that means, um, first of all, if we have x, what is the supplementary angle of x? That should give us 180 minus x, right? That is what we've established right now. Oh, sorry. So if x, then the supplementary angle is going to be 180 minus x. So these two angles must add up to give you 180. The x and x minus, uh, 180 minus x will add up to give you 180. We are saying that x is a quarter, a quarter of eight supplementary angle. You see how the language goes? x is a quarter of eight supplementary angle. So we can find x. Again, if you do um, simple cancellation here, we are going to get 45. That is, um, 
that is one quarter times 180. Okay, it's more or less saying 180 divided by 4. And that will give us 45. Minus 1 quarter times x. And that will give us x on 4. Simple. We can simplify this. Actually, from the beginning, we could have just said multiply through by the OCM so that we get it straight away and say 4x is equals to 180 minus x. But we choose to multiply through by 1 over 4. So again, it will be the same thing. If I multiply by the OCM, I'm going to still get 4 x equals 180 minus x back to that same concept now making x the subject so let me ignore this one and work on this we are going to have 4x sorry plus x equals 180 degrees so that will give us 5x is equals to 180 degrees dividing both sides by 5 then we can get our answer to be s being equal to 36. All right. So that is the answer. I wish you can take a picture of this and then solve it on your own. I'll give you the final answer. If the angles 2s minus 5 and x minus 10 are complementary, what is the value of x? If these two angles are complementary, what is the value of x? If they are complementary, what does that mean? It means they sum up to 90. So if you sum these two, it should be equal to 90. And you can do that, and then you get your answer. So when you take your time, you go through it, and I'm sure you do it and get s to be 35. Right. Take a screenshot of this one too, and I'll give you all the answer. Take your time and work through it and see if you can get the answer as such. If you work it well, you get 48 to be the answer. The question says, find the measure of an angle if 6 times 8 complement is 12 degree, less than twice 8 supplement. That means if the complement angle is 6 times, and that gives you 12 degrees less than 8 supplementary angle, what will be the value of that angle? Take your time and do this, and you get it right. Now, let's talk about adjacent angles. Adjacent angles quickly so that we can do more before our time goes. When we say two angles are adjacent, in fact, the word adjacent, we have been using it in our daily life. Sometimes we ask people direction, we say, oh, the house is adjacent the story building. Or... The house is adjacent um, that blue store or blue container. I mean, we use it a lot. And the way we use it in our daily life, the same thing applies with mathematics as well. So two angles are adjacent if they share the same vectors and have one side in common between them. Very important because we need to understand this well. So, angle A and B here, we say they are adjacent because they share the same side and they have vectors in common. Then again, look at this. The angle M and N, we say they are adjacent. But look at angle X and Y. Even though they share the same vectors, they don't share the same side or arm. For that matter, we don't call this adjacent angle. So here, X and Y are not adjacent. But M and N, A and B, are adjacent to each other. Look at this structure here. We can see adjacent angles. And we use them a lot in our um, buildings. So you can see that this angle here is adjacent to this angle. Then let's call this angle A, B, C, D. You can see that A, B are adjacent. B, C are adjacent. But A and C are not adjacent. C and D are adjacent. B and D are not adjacent. I hope it makes sense. Good. So here, can we see the adjacent angles here? 
I mean, this angle and that angle, are they? Sure, they are. So they are. When you open your book, you also see adjacent angles, right? Yes, so when you open a book, you see that a page can be in the middle, and then we see adjacent angles everywhere. So interesting. Geometry is a very wonderful course for us to study in school because it exposes us to know and understand things in around our environment. Now let's conclude this lesson with properties of angles. Properties of angles. And we're going to talk about only a few of them. Then our next lesson, that's part two, we'll look at the rest of the properties. So the first one we're going to talk about is adjacent angles on a straight line. Adjacent angles on a straight line. What happens to them if they are on the straight line. For example, I have these two lines meeting at the point where this red dot is. And I create two angles. Call angle A and let's call angle B. Because these two angles are adjacent and they are on the same straight line, we will say they are supplementary or they add up to 180. They add up to 180. Look at these three angles here too. Angle M, N, and R, they all are on the same straight line, sharing the same vectors. It means they add up to give you um, supplementary. Sorry, they add up to give you 180. But they're not supplementary, because if they are supplementary, there should be only two. So here, even though they add up to 180, we will not say they are supplementary angles, no. OK? Uh -huh. They only add up to 180, that's fine, because they are on the straight line. They only become supplementary if there are only two angles forming or adding up to give you the 180. Good. So let's take one example or two examples under this and we'll conclude this part of the course. Find the angle marked X in the diagram below or beside it here. Here is beside, not below. Okay, so um, how do you find the angle here? Now look at the three angles created here. 40 degrees, 3x, and then x. They are adjacent angles, and they are on the same straight line. So we'll say they all add up to give you 180. So 40 plus 3x plus x all should give you 180 degrees. And solving this is just an algebra. I mean, it's very easy because we've done algebra here. I know you can remember your algebra. So this will give you 40 plus 4x equals 180. If you do the calculation very well, you get your answer to be 35 as x. Now let me make, let me make something clear here before we continue. If I have this angle x and I have this angle y, the two angles are on a straight line, but they don't share the same vectors. So we can see y plus s will add up to 180. So let's make this error a lot. So let's be very careful when we say angles are on a straight line. Even though DS they on a, on a straight line, the two of them are on the same line, but they don't have the same vectors. And so we can't say they are adjacent angle on a straight line. And moreover, they are not adjacent in the first place. Yes, because they don't share the same side. Okay? Beautiful. So let's be careful about that. Now look at this question here which will be our last question to end this section. Then I'll give you a size to do. In the diagram below, X, Y, Z is a straight line. The angle marked A is less than B by 40. Find the value of A and B. Find the value of A and B. So A and B, we know, first of all, they add up to 180. That's the first and foremost thing. Then we are saying that the angle marked A is less than B by 40. So A is less than B by 40. That means B minus 40. And so A can be equal to B, but then it must be less than 40 before they will be equal. And if that is true, then we have A plus B equals this. In place of A, I can put this over there, right? So that I have B. So instead of A, I'll have B minus 40, then plus B is equals to 180. Then we can make B the subject, right? So you have 2B is equals to um, 180 plus 40. And if you add 180 plus 40, you get 2, 
um, 20. Divide both sides by 2, and that will give you B to be 110. And if B is 110, then you can easily know your A, because if you put 110 in place of B, you can make A the subject. And A will give you 70, whilst B is 110, as we said. So let's conclude by, oh, I thought I'm going to give you additional question to do, but I don't have time to do that. So what have we learned so far? This has been the SHSR for um, on joint learning, and then we are dealing with core mathematics. And the topic has been plain geometry one. It means you have plain geometry two. But then with plain geometry one, we are dealing with part one because we have a lot of concept to learn in part um, in plain geometry. So we've went through three fundamental um, terms like line, plane, and um, point. And based on these three terms, you can define all other terms. So we first define angles. And we've been working with angles all this while. We've said about types of angles. We have acute, obtuse, reflex, acu um, um, right angle, and straight angle. They will talk about complementary and supplementary angle. They will talk about angles forming on the straight line. That is the far we've been able to go for today. I'm sure you've learned a lot. And this has been your facilitator events or day. Thanks so much for watching. See you another time for part two of this lesson. Bye-bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.